So I'm recording now. I do have my chat window open. So if you do want to chat uh, or have any questions or anything, um, we have the chat window over there. And then I also kind of like it when you can use the reactions. I wish they almost had a thumbs down. Uh, don't raise your hand though, because I can't see that. I don't have like all the pictures of your faces. If you have a question, uh, put that in the chat because I can't see the chat. So sorry if you were maybe raised your hand the last time we met, but again, I, I can't really see the raised hand. Um, I wish, yeah, like there was a thumbs down or maybe like a stop sign or a yellow light, like slow down. Um, we should write Zoom about that. Okay, but today is the last day before the uh, test, which is on Monday. And so kind of what I wanted to cover today was I wanted to uh, look a little bit more specifically about COVID-19 related proteins. And I created a PyMol assignment. It's the last one. But this PyMol assignment uh, accounts as your exam one bonus. So um, I don't know the final total points of the bonus that we have to wait till after the average of the exam one is calculated. But the work that you put in up until it's due um, Monday by midnight, so the day before the exam, which is Tuesday, um, you have until then. It's like four figures, and a couple of them have a few parts in the figure that I want you to do. Um, but yeah, so uh, there's that that you can also be working on this weekend. So just to kind of recap, or if you want in the chat box, are there some things you would like for me to go over or cover um, before we kind of start talking about COVID-19? Today, I don't really have the, like a super game plan of what I wanted to accomplish. Uh, I do want to accomplish some of the structure of the COVID, uh, structure function analysis of the COVID proteins. But if there are other things you would like to look at, as well, or have questions on, I'd be happy to help with that as well. Maybe some of you are typing like crazy, because I know when I have a question, usually that's what I do. Uh, just to recap what's due, let's go to Canvas real quick, because Canvas calendar should have us, let's see, calendar. Mm -mm -mm. Mm -mm -mm -mm. And okay, so today, uh, I likely it should be by tonight by midnight, or no, it was before class. Uh, before class today, your myoglobin and hemoglobin pymol analysis was due. Um, I should be able to look over those and give you some feedback or some grades at least, uh, hopefully tomorrow. Um, tomorrow, it looks like your case study on mermaids is due. So hopefully you've been working and reading on that. Again, I can I encourage you to work with other people uh, either via Zoom or if you kind of live in the same dorm or in the same area, you can meet up somewhere in a common space uh, and work on giving your answers for that. If you do work in a group, only one person has to submit the answers, but make sure everybody's name is on the document that you submit. On Sunday, you've got your reading quizzes uh, that are due. You should be able to honestly answer all of those today. I do know that in the structure function one, there are some questions about collagen. And this morning I just posted my lecture short on uh, talking about collagen. They also in the structure function and possibly in the levels of protein structure, there's a little bit that talks about uh, folding and molecular chaperones. Um, there is, uh, that is in the slides and it's also covered in your book. But sometimes proteins don't fold properly and they need some help. And so that's what molecular chaperones do is they assist proteins in proper folding or unfolding and proper assembly. So when you have complexes that come together and need to assemble together, um, molecular chaperones can aid in the assembly of these larger complexes. Off the top of my head, what I can think of is the bacterial flagella, the long skinny flagella is made up of a single polypeptide that has you know thousands of copies of it uh, and it's called fly c is the name of the protein but if you were to uh, as fly c is being made inside the cytoplasm it would start to aggregate together it's got a lot of hydrophobic amino acids so it would start to aggregate together so there is a molecular chaperone that actually kind of grabs that polypeptide chain as it's coming off of the ribosome and blocks it from aggregating with itself 
that uh, molecular chaperone that kind of shuttles it to where the flagella is being synthesized and then allows the fly C polypeptide to um, snake its way up through the flagellal tube and uh, make that flagellar protein uh, piece. So that's an example of a molecular chaperone. So again, they kind of aid in the folding uh, or sometimes unfolding and assembly or disassembly of larger protein complexes. There is one major protein or molecular chaperone and it's called grow ELES. Um, EL and ES kind of describe the domains uh, of this barrel-like molecular chaperone. It essentially is a very large barrel. Think of a barrel. It's kind of even what the structure looks like. And uh, not properly folded proteins or potentially misfolded proteins uh, get placed inside that barrel. And they are given an environment that is fairly free of, of water. Uh, and so they're allowed to kind of unfold a little bit and then refold in their proper shape. So 30% of all your proteins that are synthesized in your cells end up getting their final native confirmation from the help of grow ELES. So those are just a couple things when I was looking through the quizzes that uh, I didn't really mention in any lectures, but again, they are in your book and they are kind of, and they are on the slides. So there are, there is that. So that's due Sunday. Then again, on Monday by midnight is when the exam one bonus COVID-19 spike protein pymol analysis will be uh, due. Let me pull up the chat. Okay, still nobody. All right, so, okay. So then let's go ahead and talk. Um, oh, look at all this. Okay, can you give us a list of what could be on the test, especially things from lecture videos you posted? Like what's fair game? So fair game, um, man, uh, <laughs> fair game is pretty much anything and everything. Uh, I was going to try to uh, whip up some learning objectives for the chapters. Uh, but essentially, if we covered it in class or it's covered on any of those short pre-recorded lectures, I will say, especially the ones that I did, then that's going to be fair game for the test. Uh, there are some pre-recorded lectures. There's one that we're going to kind of watch today as we talk about how the, co uh, the COVID vaccine works. And that's the one that talks about the human immunity and all the different cells and what they're doing. Like that's not on this test that if you're in it taking immunology, that would be on a test in there. But for biochem, I'm not going to I'm not going to ask questions about immunology like that. Um, anything on a case study uh, is fair game. Anything, like I said, and like the my pre-recorded lectures is fair game. Uh, it covers chapters one through four. So if we review chapter one is essentially a review of uh, like an introduction to basic, basic, basic biochemistry. It introduces the four building blocks and then talks about review of some things from general chemistry, organic chemistry and biology that really continually play roles in what we learn. And, and to be able to understand the content that we're covering, it's good to have that kind of a background base. It also talks a little bit about kind of the early life. So then you guys watch that episode of the cosmos and that was really uh, fun. I had a great time reading your questions and I tried to respond back and answer any questions that I could. Uh, and some, I just said, yeah, that's a really great question. I have no idea. <laughs> An astrophysicist would be the one I would, I would be asking. Um, look, I'm just a biochemist here <laughs> that likes to think about science, lots of different sciences. Um, but okay, so we did that. Chapter two, covered water and buffers. That was the big things from chapter two. Uh, and I think also uh, types of non-covalent interactions. Water had, man, I think it was seven properties we went over. So you should be able to uh, list those properties and provide a brief explanation of that property. Like for example, water has a high heat capacity. Okay, well, what is high heat capacity? You should be able to define that and then explain how that high heat capacity, like what biological function does that give us? Um, uh, things like that. So high heat capacity is the uh, ability that water has to absorb a lot of energy to raise one degree. And that's really good because it acts as a, an insulator for our chemical reactions. Most, almost 
well, most of our reactions that are occurring in our body are exothermic. So they're generating a bunch of heat and that heat has to go somewhere. The heat could potentially, if it gets hot enough, denature proteins and create wreak all kinds of havoc, right? It's why if you get a fever uh, over a certain temperature about like 104, 105, usually they're trying to cool you off as quickly as possible because you can start to denature and misfold your proteins in your cells, which can, again, create all kinds of issues, breathing issues, neurological damage. Um, so high heat capacity. So the ability that it can absorb so much energy <laughs> before the temperature raises one degree. Uh, so it's acting as an, uh, as an insulator, essentially a nano insulator of the chemical reactions. So that's like an example. So that's one. There are six more you should be able to do to, and to some extent. Uh, you then we talked about non-covalent interactions. So the strongest uh, interaction between two atoms is a covalent, right? Where they're sharing the electrons. Uh, and then under that, then you can start listing all of the non-covalent interactions. Uh, the second, so the strongest non-covalent interaction is ion pair. And then it goes hydrogen bonding and da 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 da. So you should be able to like list the strengths of those bonds. Um, the third thing was buffers. And I was talking with a couple of people yesterday and essentially when it boils down to buffers, there's gonna be three types of buffer questions that get asked in biochemistry. Um, the first type of a buffer question would be if you mix an, a weak acid with a strong base, what's gonna be, what's the pH, what happens there? And do, do, hold on, let me share this. Wait, uh, you can't, well, other, oh, it's, oh, I'm sharing, ha ha ha, stop share. Share, that's why I wanted my little tablet here so I could kind of have like a, a drawing whiteboard. Mm -mm -mm. Oh, look, there's my primary structure. New, note, blank. Okay, so there, there'll be three types of, in general, buffer questions. The first type of, of buffer question is if you mix a weak acid with a strong base. Okay. Um, typically in biochemistry, I only ever look at like starting with weak acids and mixing them with strong bases. The question could have a weak base mixing with a strong acid, but then you're looking at PKBs and uh, the base equation. And, and I don't even want you to focus on that. I just want you to focus on one half of the whole uh, buffer story, which is the weak acid side. So a weak acid, remember, we'll denote that as HA and a strong base immediately in your head, probably you should be thinking sodium hydroxide. That's a great strong base, readily available. Uh, if these two react together, you're going to form, so we have our HA. Hey, let's just draw out an HA here. A weak acid, for example, is acetic acid. And sodium hydroxide, sodium is a spectator ion. It always has been. It always will be. Unfortunately, it's just not that important. It's just holding a charge. So the, the main important chemi chemical part of sodium hydroxide is the hydroxide part. And this is our strong base. It's anything that has a localized charge, like a, an, an, a one minus, this kind of relates to organic chemistry, is really unhappy. It doesn't want to have that localized charge. Uh, so it's going to try to fix itself. So it's going to grab that hydrogen, and then the uh, bonding electrons are going to jump up on that oxygen, and then you form acetate and water. So this is my HA, this is my strong base, this is my A minus, and then I form a water molecule. Kind of to play off what I just said, relating to organic chemistry and having a localized negative charge, maybe you're thinking, Dr. Hughes, this molecule right here also has a localized charge. No, like why is that not unhappy and that grabs the proton off the water? And to that, I would answer and say to you, in fact, this is not a localized charge. This is a delocalized charge. And what I mean by delocalized is that that negative charge, remember, you can draw a second, ugh, brown on black, a second resonance structure, and you can show that this oxygen also takes some of that negative charge. 
So that's the difference. So this oxygen right here has that localized charge. Mm, it's just really angry and upset with that. <laughs> Uh, but this a negative charge on the right for your A minus is able to delocalize. So it's it's more stable, uh, which that answers that question. But anyways, so if I asked you to, if in my question, um, react a weak acid in a strong base, you need to determine how many moles at equilibrium you'll have of HA and A minus. Then you can likely just plug that into the henderson hasselbalch equation. Because if I give you a weak acid, all weak acids have a pKa value. Don't forget, if I gave you the Ka, you can solve for the pKa, right? Because Ka, to solve for pKa, pKa well, is equal to the negative log of the Ka. There's no way you can memorize Ka's and pKa values. Like that's not something you need to do. I will give you either a Ka or a pKa value for the weak acids uh, in the question. Okay, so um, again, so whenever you see something like this, weak acid and strong base, you gotta be thinking, man, I'm gonna have to do an ice table. What's my initial concentration? The change is gonna be the moles of the hydroxide ion. And then what are the amounts that I have at equilibrium? So in this reaction here at equilibrium, if I have my HA and my OH minus and I make A minus and water, water we don't care about because it's the bulk of the solution anyways. Uh, and then at equilibrium, all of that OH minus will have reacted. So you will have no zero moles of OH minus remaining. So really the only two things you will have at equilibrium are HA and A minus and a whole bunch of water. But like I said, it's, it's bulk solution. So you just ignore it. Okay, so um, let me pull up my chat real quick. How do we feel on questions like that? On that, um, I'll go over the next two, but how does that feel? Let's do the little thumbs up things, or you can ask a question. Oh, there are my thumbs up. Why aren't they going in my chat box? Okay, well, I see a few up at the top. Okay, so the second type of acid-based question that you might come across is if you mix a weak acid with it's conjugate base. Hey, Preston wants to know if you can do an ice table on the last question. You have to do an ice table. That's the only way to solve that one. No, I'm saying like, can you model that one. for us? Like, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Deedly deep, deedly deep. All right, I'm gonna make up a whole, I'll do like a sample question. I'll make up a whole bunch of numbers. Okay, so let's say, I'm going to mix 20 milliliters of five molar acetic acid, acetic acid with uh, five milliliters of three molar sodium hydroxide. Okay, there's a lot of variable numbers here, right? I can change the concentrations, I can change the volumes, but you're, you get what, what's happening here. So I've got my acetic acid, that's the HA, right? I'm mixing it with sodium hydroxide, that's strong base. So, and I write an ice table. Sometimes I call it the rice table and the R stands for reaction. So we could write the reaction above first. So my reaction would be HA plus OH minus yields A minus plus water. And I'm just gonna, again, go ahead and cross out water because it's the bulk of the solution. I don't even care anyways. So I initial, you need to get, you have to figure out how many initial moles of everything you have in solution initially. Uh, how do you solve for moles? Well, what's molarity is moles over liters. And then I have milliliters here. So I just need to take my molarity and multiply it by the volume that I have, but in liters. So the very first one will be five. I guess if I like try to do a quick off to the side, It'd be five moles per liter times by 0 0.02 liters. 20 milliliters is that number. Um, look for a calculator. My mental math can be, I think that's one, right? Five times 0 0.2? Yes, is one. So I actually have one mole of HA. How many moles of OH minus do I have? Well, again, the math is three molar moles per liter times five milliliters. 
0 0.005 liters. So three times three times 0 0.005, and I get 0 0.015 moles. How much A minus do I have initially? Initially, zero. I don't have any. All I have is strong base and a weak acid. So I don't have any of this. And again, it makes water and I don't, we don't care about water. So there's gonna be a change. And what's my change? The X. Okay. Again, you call the reaction. This okay. is going to react and steal the proton from that. So the change is gonna be the amount of strong base. And so if I'm taking away the hydroxide from here, I'm going to be reacting it with the HA. So I also subtract it from here and then you add it to the right side. And you add it to the water too, but again, you don't just like forget that the water's even there with these. And then at equilibrium, what do you have? So you would have one less that value, one minus 0.015. So you'd have 0 0.985 moles of HA. You would have zero hydroxide because it's gone. And the amount of A minus you'd have would be 0 0.015 moles, okay? Uh, so you know the HA and you know the A minus. And you remembered that the Henderson-Hasselbach is pH equals pick a log, aha. Pick a log, aha, okay? Um, I could, what is this, acetic acid? Acetic acid has a pKa of uh, 4.75. So 4.75 plus log. And again, this log here, this is in concentration, but you can, it's okay to actually put, plug moles in right here. You don't have to go back to what the concentration is. You can plug moles in. As long as both of them are in moles, everything's fine. So the amount of A minus I had is 0 0.015 moles. The amount of HA that I had was a way more moles, uh, and then you would plug and chug and solve for pH. So there's your ice table for those. That's what it looks like. You could level that type of a question up and you could have, which I don't think I did in any quizzes or anything, but if you mixed uh, HA, plus A minus plus HCl all together. This is another example where you would have to have an ice table. Okay. So for example, let's say I have, and I'm trying to make this just easy. I have uh, one liter of five molar HA. I've got 0 0.1 liters of three molar A minus and I'm adding 50 milliliters of one molar hydrochloric acid. Okay, we have to think about the chemistry that's going on in our flask. Uh, so th these three items would be mixed in with water. Okay, I've got my strong acid right here, right? This is a weak acid and that's the weak conjugate base. So what, what, is something gonna react? And if so, what's gonna react together? You can unmute yourself if you know the answer. So something, is something gonna react? And if so, what's gonna react? Strong things hate, hate being there. <laughs> they wanna react with something. The strong acid and the conjugate base. Exactly. So our equation in our rice table, because we'd have to do a rice because there's going to be some kind of a reaction. Um, so we would have to say that A minus plus HCl yields HA. That's our R. Initially, you go through and you find out how many uh, moles of everything there is of our A minus. We've got 0.1 liter and three molar. So that means we have 0.3 moles. For our HCl, we have 50 milliliters of one molar. So we have 0 0.05 moles. And for our HA, we have uh, 100 milliliters of five molar. So we have 0 0.5 moles of HA. 
Notice in this question, I have an initial for each of them. In the previous example, I didn't, but that's because I only had like two things in my, in my solution I was starting with. Now I'm starting with three things in my beaker. All right, there's gonna be a change. The change is gonna be the strong thing, right? That's gonna force itself to do some type of chemistry. And this uh, HCl is gonna protonate the conjugate base. So we subtract on the left and we add on the right of the equation. So at equilibrium, you should have 0 0.25 moles of this, none of that, and 0 0.55 moles of HA. And then again, it'd be like a plug and chug Henderson Hasselbach at that point. Instead of HCl, what if I had said some base like sodium hydroxide? So I still have HA, I have A minus, but instead of the acid, maybe I add a strong base. What will the strong base react with? The HA or the A minus? HA. Exactly. So you would do all this rice table or the ice table, but you have to change your equation because you have to be thinking about what is the chemistry that's going on. And thankfully in biochemistry, most of the time, we're just talking about stealing a proton away from somebody. <laughs> Organics way more complicated, but biochem, we're easy like that. Okay, so you would have like those types of questions for buffers. You would have a simple one where an example where there's just some amount of HA and some amount of A minus, I would give you. And I just say, hey, if I take this much of the acid and this much of the conjugate base and I mix them together, what's the pH of the solution? This type of question does not require an ice table because there is no reaction going on. HA and A minus aren't going to be reacting with one another. Um, so this question is super straightforward, plug and chug, Henderson Hasselbach. Okay, again, no reaction going on, so there's no need for an ice table. This is straight Henderson Hasselbach. So that's like the second type of question you would have. The third type is the one that says uh, the percent ionized or percent protonated or percent deprotonated. Okay, and I think we worked one of those in class. I can come up with one off the top of my head if you would like for me to, um, but it's really a, a use of the Henderson Hasselbach. You would have to be given a pH. You would have to know the pKa or solve for the pKa. Uh, and then you look at, you're figuring out the ratio between the A minus and the HA, right? The HA is the protonated form and the A minus is the deprotonated form. Okay, so that's the buffers part. It's usually the part that is maybe the most um, terrifying. <laughs> terrifying is it not the, I don't know, that's not the most worried about part, I think. So any questions you can throw them up in the chat box, but um, that's the buffer. So that's chapter two. Chapter three covers amino acids. You know the structure of all 20 of them. You should be able to draw the structure of all 20 of them. Three letter codes, one letter codes, PKA values of those nine ionizable groups. Um, and then you have to know kind of what we went over that one day of what the ionizing states look like. And what I mean by that is on a carboxylic acid, if it's protonated in a protonated form, does it have a charge or is it neutral? So carboxylic acid protonated is neutral, right? When it's deprotonated, it's negative one. Um, the like histidine, when it's protonated, what does that mean? Does it have a charge or is it neutral? Um, so things like that. So you should be able to identify the charges of those ionizable side chains and how that kind of relates to pKa. Titration curves we covered extensively. You should be able to draw a titration curve or read, even read a titration curve. Um, we also went over what else did we, uh, drawing the polypeptide chains together. So drawing out uh, um, polypeptide structures, calculating isoelectric points, all of the ways to analyze the sequence, the primary sequence, gel filtration, 
um, isoelectric focusing, SDS page gels, native page, gel, page gels, uh, sequencing with enzyme digests, right? We did, that was a like a homework problem we did there. So that covers kind of chapter three. And then now chapter four talks about the four levels of structure. So you should be able to define what they all are and um, be able to you know, like use them in sentences when you're explaining things. The secondary structure shows blah, 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 blah. Um, then there was also a little bit about protein folding. And the main driving force of protein folding is the collapse of hydrophobic core. Um, proteins sometimes need chaperones, molecular chaperones to help them fold properly. And then we get into structure function. So myoglobin, hemoglobin, binding curves. This is again where the case study is coming into play that's due tomorrow. Uh, really kind of asks you a lot of questions and makes you think about uh, how the function, like the actual, the biological roles of myoglobin and hemoglobin in aquatic life and in humans. Uh, then I had a one that covered collagen. And today we are going to talk a little bit about antibodies and look at some structures of antibodies as best we can on Pymol. Um, antibodies are very massive. There actually is not a crystal structure of a full antibody. There's only crystal structures of fragments of the antibodies. Cause like I said, they're just too massive. They don't, um, crystallize as of yet, <laughs> they don't crystallize. Uh, we have cryo-EM images of them. So cryo-EM is a microscopy, electron microscopy at very, very, very cold temperatures, hence cryo. Uh, and so you can get an idea of the overall shape. And that's why we know it's this like Y shape. Or if you ever see a picture uh, that looks pretty realistic of an antibody, uh, it's because we know the cryo-EM overall structure. And then we do know the crystal structures of little small pieces. So they, you know, the scientists kind of fit that in there and get an idea of what the main structure would look like. So that's possible. But unfortunately I, I searched the PDB, there's not one crystal structure of an entire uh, antibody. Okay, so then that kind of summarizes the review. And then we have one question about a review of the Bohr effect. Okay, so a quick review of the Bohr effect, which was also, Chapter four, it's talking about hemoglobin. When you talk about the Bohr effect, it's the effect that increased um, H plus uh, uh, releases oxygen from bound hemoglobins. So this is the Bohr effect. And when we talk about the Bohr effect, this is where a little bit of that background about biology so uh, is gonna come into play. So this is kind of like a, the blood. So this is maybe an arterial, an artery carrying around red blood cells and red blood cells, as we remember from that one David Goodsell picture are chocked full of hemoglobins. <laughs> so we got lots of hemoglobin in the blood. And then this is maybe a tissue cell. And in order to function and survive, these cells are using glucose or fatty acids to generate energy in the form of ATP. Okay. When you break down either a glucose molecule or a fatty acid molecule, you generate a lot of carbon dioxide. Okay. So going from glucose or fatty acids down to create energy. Well, I'll just write ATP. And that's a super oversimplification of the process, but later in this in the book, chapters 11 through 14, we cover that process at the biochemical level. Uh, but that's super overview of it. Uh, you generate lots and lots and lots of carbon dioxide. Okay, so tissue cells, actively respiring tissue cells, are, are releasing carbon dioxide. Recall carbon dioxide is a nonpolar molecule and so is oxygen. Oxygen is also nonpolar. Nonpolar molecules have no problem crossing the uh, phospholipid bilayers of all the cells. So of the red blood cells or of the tissue cells, they, got, they have no problem doing that. They're just nonpolar. So you see very readily that carbon dioxide can pass over, pass through the cell membranes. 
I should also maybe in a different color say inside the cells, you've got a really high concentration of CO2. And what really important molecule is necessary over here in this breakdown in order to drive the formation of energy? It's another gaseous molecule. Which one is really important for that? I would say it's the terminal electron acceptor of the electron transport chain. Which one am I talking about? Oxygen. I am, O2, oxygen. So if cells are actively respiring and needing to create that energy, they are absorbing and using up their oxygen. So over, you know, it starts to have a really low concentration of oxygen inside the tissue because the cells are using it, right? They're, the mitochondria are using it as that terminal electron acceptor of the transport chain so it can make this ATP. In the blood though, there's, there's a different story going on, okay? The blood, you got a red blood cell and that has the hemoglobin molecules in it with the oxygens bound. So in the blood, you have a really high concentration of oxygen and you have a very low concentration of CO2. So simple diffusion, that's when molecules move from areas of high concentration to low concentration is also what's, what's going to help drive that uh, movement of these molecules so oxygen can be delivered from the hemoglobins into the cells so they can be the terminal electron uh, chain, uh, a terminal electron acceptor of the electron transport chain. And then the carbon dioxide is gonna move to areas of lower CO2 uh, uh, concentration. So it's gonna move into the blood. Once the carbon dioxide moves into the blood, and remember, it can also, I should try to draw it, that it passes the membrane of our red blood cell. So this is our red blood cell, red blood cell. Okay. Uh, so carbon dioxide can freely pass into this uh, red blood cell. And once it's inside the cell, there is an enzyme that will react carbon dioxide with water and give you H2CO3, and that's pretty unstable. So it almost immediately breaks down into H plus and HCO3 minus. HCO3 uh, minus is bicarbonate. That's like the baking soda you buy at the grocery store. You, um, you find that it likes to, it's the buffering system of the blood. So it's going to shift out into the bulk liquid of the blood, but in order to maintain an overall electrostatic potential of the membrane, you can't just pump out all of this negative charge. The interior would become very positively charged and that could be bad. So there is this um, transporter, this membrane transporter that pumps out HCO3, but pumps in a chloride ion just so that the overall charge stays the same on either side of the cell. So the Bohr effect is sometimes called the chloride shift and that's the chloride shifting part, okay? So the plot thickens a little bit because uh, the Bohr effect talks about how an increase in H plus releases oxygen from hemoglobin. So your tissues are pumping out all this carbon dioxide and what it's doing essentially is it's acidifying the inside of your red blood cell because you're creating all these free H pluses inside the red blood cell. Um, that again, though, is where our hemoglobin lies. And some of those hemoglobins tend to have that 2,3-BPG that's bound, right? 2,3-BPG holds, uh, likes to keep hemoglobin in the, um, uh, hold it more in that tense state. So uh, hold on. Rewind. <laughs> Some molecules of hemoglobin have two, three BPG bound, but most of them do not yet. Okay, so the hemoglobins right now are in the R state. They're relaxed because they all have their oxygen molecules. But where do these free protons go? So they can get absorbed onto some of those surface residues of the hemoglobin. When we think about how two, three BPG binds, you guys made the image. There are two histidines that make an electrostatic interaction with 2,3-BPG. And recall, histidine has a pK of around six. The cell is about 7.2, 7.4 pH. 
So a lot of those histidines are, are deprotonated, so they're neutral. In order to make a really favorable electrostatic interaction with those negative phosphates on the 2,3-BPG, you want that histidine, the histidine to be positively charged. So you want it to be protonated. And it gets protonated because of the increasing uh, concentration of H plus that's occurring from the reaction between carbon dioxide and water. Is that a thumbs up or is that a repeat? And you might want, if you want to repeat, so you can type that in the text box. Okay, I got a couple repeats. Okay, so that, that's like a big concept right there. So you recall that, um, so when 2,3-BPG binds, that pushes the hemoglobin to be in the T state and offload some oxygen molecules. 2,3-BPG needs to bind to the hemoglobin in that central cavity pocket. And that pocket contains two histidine residues, two lysines, two histidines. Um, and those two histidines, in order to stabilize the negative charges on the 2,3-BPG, it would bind better if they were positively charged histidines. I mean, you would agree there because then you would have a positive and a negative super close in space. So the pKa of histidine is six and the physiological pH of the blood is about 7.4. This is, right, the pKa, this is more than one pH unit away. So we start to be in the realm, like I could safely say that at pH 7.4, maybe 1% of histidines are protonated. Okay, so 99% are deprotonated, and a histidine deprotonated is a neutral compound. So, ah, sorry. Right, our histidines deprotonated. De nope. This one here and that one there. That's our neutral histidine. And our protonated form of that side chain would be positively charged. And our 2,3-BPG molecule looks like this, negative, negative, uh, O, P, O, 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 negative, negative. I've got one, two, three, four, five negative charges on that molecule. And if that molecule binds hemoglobin, the hemoglobins are gonna kick off the oxygen. And that would be good because we want those cells to get that oxygen but right now they're not really bound, okay? Why aren't they bound so tightly? Like some are kind of, but they're not really bound because most of those histidines are, have a neutral charge, right? It would be more favorable and this 2,3-BPG would bind better and tighter if the histidines were positively charged. So is that a thumbs up? Can we get a thumbs up there on some of those, that idea that 2,3-BPG will bind better if the histidines are positively charged, right now they're neutral. We wanna get them positively charged. Okay, got it, most, most thumbs up. So as CO2 reacts with water in the cell, you're going to create protons. You're gonna decrease the pH. So those protons are gonna go somewhere and one place that that proton could go, oh, I gotta zoom out for this, is right here on that neutral histidine. That neutral histidine has that nitrogen with that lone pair and it can pick up that proton. Because also remember that histidine was right there on the surface, like it's out there facing the water. And those histidine or those hemoglobins are like, you know, back to back crammed in these red blood cells. So as soon as a free proton's out, that histidine can pop, can pick it up pretty quick. So that gives us a histidine with a positive charge, which then can allow 2,3-BPG to bind which then would kick off more oxygen from the hemoglobin. That's like the big ha finale of that logical stepping of how an increase in H plus helps release oxygen from the hemoglobin. Oops. So the H plus that's created from the formation of the carbonic acid protonates the histidines, which strengthens an interaction between 2,3-BPG and the hemoglobin, 
which then allows the hemoglobin to shift into its T state and it kicks off the oxygens. So you end up reacting, how that looks like is HBO2. So you would say H plus plus HBO2 yields HB plus oxygen molecules. And those oxygen molecules can leave the red blood cell and they can move out over and diffuse towards the area of low concentration, which is in the cells because they're actively using that oxygen. Uh, the Bohr effect by far, this level of understanding is a very uh, high tier thinking, you know. This isn't, a, <laughs> this isn't a memorize a definition kind of thing. This is a logical progression of chemistry that's occurring and then having to think globally about the interactions between molecules or allosteric inhibitors and their target proteins as well. Okay. Um, the other thing that there's an, a second way that the carbon dioxide can help kick off oxygens. And that's because the carbon dioxide can bind to the end terminus of the hemoglobins and form a carbamate adduct. And that destabilizes the structure, the quaternary structure a little bit that makes it easier for oxygen to leave. So there's like two routes that the CO2 plays and as, and as far as kicking off oxygens from the hemoglobins. And the one route is the one I just talked about where essentially you end up protonating the histidines which then can bind 2,3-BPG 2, 3 2, 3 better and that kicks off the oxygens. And the other route is that the, the CO2 covalently uh, links up with the N termini which destabilizes the quaternary structure. It's shifted a little bit and that can kick off some of the oxygens. Woo! What is this process with the histidine called and the Bohr effect? Um, I think, so the process with the histidine and the Bohr effect, that would just be, I mean, I, I think what you're looking for, the answer is, is just protonation. So the, um, well, so the histidine becomes protonated and then that would strengthen the ion pair, the electrostatic interaction between the inhibitor and hemoglobin to answer your question. All right, so that is a lot of, a lot. That's, that's really deep. So again, I have a video where I kind of talk through this and you can watch this video again and see me try to, uh, uh, me explaining it a couple more times. Um, but in general, that's the Bohr effect. And then when you move to the lungs, almost all this stuff runs in reverse because the uh, concentrations of the oxygen and the carbon dioxide are flipped at that point. So in the lungs, you've got high oxygen, low CO2, and in the red blood cells that are coming back to the lungs, you've got high CO2 and low oxygen. So you essentially run all those reactions backwards in reverse. Okay, so uh, any other questions before we move on to talk about COVID? share. Um, yes, continue. All right. So um, one thing that, you know, I did want to try to uh, incorporate into this class is uh, topics of biochemistry and how we, we can use biochemistry to help us explain um, the COVID process. And the one thing that I've come up a lot with my person, my family, my personal family, on either side, my husband and my, my, myself, is that it seems like half of my relatives want to get the vaccine and the other half are like H to the no, I'm not getting the vaccine. And I asked them, you know, well, how does it, well, how does the vaccine work? And, you know, no, you know, no, nobody knows. So I'm kind of of the opinion that I think the media is doing a terrible job of not explaining to people how the vaccine works. So I did some digging and I have uh, figured out from the research that's been done on mRNA vaccines, uh, my understanding of how this COVID vaccine is, it, it works. Oh, let me pull up a uh, picture super quick. Stop this share. Share. Uh, if you go to, you can look up the ingredients of the uh, COVID vaccines and, you know, the ingredient list, there's not a whole lot. We'll just keep it in this one. There's not a whole lot of scary stuff in the ingredient list 
of the vaccines. Essentially, you've got some lipid molecules, you've got an mRNA strand, and that's like the proprietary thing where, and, and you know, deep in a bunch of, um, of, oh my goodness, patents, you can probably find the sequence and how it's modified. But they've got some lipid molecules, they've got mRNA, there is sucrose, which is table sugar, and that is a, a, a cryoprotectant. So some of these vaccines have to be stored at really cold temperatures and sucrose helps to just protect the structure of everything at really low temperatures. Uh, and then it's got some stabilizers in it. So those stabilizers are things that you could you know, eat in your food stabilizers. So some bicarbonate, uh, it had some acetic acid or some acetate. I don't think it was just acetate itself. Uh, and a few other things like salts. There was some phosphate, there's some calcium. So there's salt. So, I mean, I look at that list and as a, a scientist, I'm not like, oh, I can't get that. You know, there's a, there's no crazy mercury or plutonium or anything nuts. Like it all seems like it's fine stuff to me. So if you were to get, if I had to kind of envision what a vial, what's in that vial, what it looks like is there is an mRNA strand that, and it probably likely is folded upon itself because mRNA can uh, tends to make these bigger secondary structure complexes. So there's the mRNA. And then surrounding that mRNA is this lipid. So you've got, like, I like to think of it as these tiny spheres that, that are lipid. And then inside those lipid vesicles, you're going to have the mRNA strand. And then floating around in solution, right, you've got the stabilizers and the sugar and the salts or whatnot. But so this is uh, what is going to eventually help you get immunity towards the COVID-19. Uh, COVID uh, the mRNA strand codes, the sequence codes for the uh, spike protein of the COVID-19. And when you think about that structure you see everywhere about this virus particle, right? There is on the surface, you've got these like little things sticking off and those little things sticking off are the spike proteins, okay? So essentially what's gonna happen is, is your body is gonna be delivered the code on how to make the COVID spike protein. And then your body will uh, build up some immunity against that. Okay. So with me saying that, I want to uh, go back and take a look at this video. Oh yeah, I got to stop share over here. Good night. Um, share my screen, continue here, share. Okay. And, and I don't think it's going to play sound because I don't, I think I didn't do the best job with that, but all we really need are the pictures here. And then you can go back after this and watch the video with all the <laughs> explanation. Um, but essentially we're gonna pull up that one video that talks about your immune system. It was like seven minutes or something. This one, the immune system explained. This one I thought was just like such a good video. Um, okay, so hopefully you watched this video and you saw like, oh, I, I cut myself on this rusty, dusty nail, and all of a sudden in my cell, there is a bacteria that gets Please inside the cut. Can you hear that? Thumbs up if you can hear that. But when a certain bacteria okay, so you can hear the stuff. Okay. And start to damage the body by changing the environment around them. The immune system has to stop them as fast as possible. First of all, your guard cells, known as macrophages, intervene. They are huge. So right here is where you go up to the um, COVID testing or drive-through vaccine vaccination facility at the horse park, and they shoot, inject you with the shot of the COVID vaccine. Remember what I said the vaccine is, right? Like it's those balls of lipid, lipid and on the inside there's an mRNA. So immediately in your arm where you get the shot, it's kind of like in this video, all those bacteria. That is a foreign substance to your body and your body's gonna start to fight it like it's an invading something. Like, cause again, your, your immune system doesn't know what it is. So, so I believe that these ma like macrophages are gonna start to 
to absorb some and gulf it up and, and get rid of it immediately. But we keep watching the immune response. Cells that guard every border region of the body. Most of the time, they alone can suffocate an attack because they can devour up to 100 intruders each. They swallow the intruder whole and trap it inside the membrane. Then the enemy gets broken down by enzymes and is killed. On top of that, they cause inflammation by ordering the blood vessels to release water into the battlefield so fighting becomes easier. You notice this as a very mild swelling. When the macrophages fight for too long, they call... Swelling at the injection site of any vaccine is a common thing, and that's because, again, it's your immune system picking it up and being like, what the heck is this stuff? Get this out of here. <laughs> we got to fight it. Heavy backup by releasing messenger proteins that communicate location and urgency. Neutrophiles leave their patrol routes in the blood and move to the battlefield. The neutrophiles fight so furiously that they kill healthy cells in the process. Um that is an answer to somebody's question of why does our immune system kill our own self? Remember we watched that video at the beginning in the lungs and it was like, and then these things, you know, the immune response kills some of the good cells in your lungs too. So that's because of these neutrophiles, which are just, uh, just going crazy trying to stop this invasion of this foreign species in your body. Of that, they generate barriers that trap and kill the bacteria. They are indeed so deadly that they evolved to commit suicide after five days to prevent them from causing too much damage. If this is not enough to stop the invasion, the brain of the immune system kicks in. The dendritic cell gets active. It reacts to the signals of the soldiers and starts collecting samples from the enemies. So this cell is the one that's ultimately going to help you and me, when we get the vaccine, create antibodies. So that your body's fighting it, macrophages are engulfing it. There's still some of the vaccine, um, those little lipid bundles with the mRNA strand inside. And when the dendritic cells arrive, then this goes on. They rip them into pieces and present the parts on their own to let the cell Back gets up. active. It reacts to the signals of the soldiers and starts collecting samples from the enemies. They rip them into pieces and present the parts on their outer layer. Now, the dendritic cell makes a crucial decision. Should they call for antivirus forces that eradicate infected body cells or an army of bacteria killers? So here's where some things differ a little bit for the COVID vaccine. So uh, the dendritic cells will take and engulf the, those lipid mRNAs that uh, the vaccine is. And then eventually those mRNAs have to get expressed and they'll express the spike protein. The dendritic cells still rip apart the spike protein into bits and chunks and display them on the outside of the dendritic cells, uh, but they don't, they, they've never seen this stuff before, right? So they don't, I don't know if it can tell whether to go the viral route or the bacterial route just from this one protein. So likely though, the dendritic cell is still gonna make this trip up to the lymph node, which is happening here. But I don't know about the decision-making part in this video and how that would relate to this brand new spike you know, pieces of spike protein being displayed on the outside of the dendritic cell. In this case, antibacteria forces are necessary. It then travels to the closest lymph node in about a day. Here, billions of helper and killer T cells are waiting to be activated. When T cells are born, they go through a difficult and complicated training process, and only a quarter survives. The surviving cells are equipped with a specific setup and the dendritic cell is on its way looking for a helper T cell with a setup that's just right. So in this uh, image right here, so we have that dendritic cell coming in from the top and these little kind of like green pyramid things, those would be bits and pieces of the COVID spike protein that had been expressed and then ripped apart and then displayed on the outside of the, of the dendritic cells. Now they're looking for the matching miraculous T cell that's gonna fit some piece of any one of those little displayed, you know, shredded apart uh, spike proteins. It's looking for a helper T cell that combines the parts of the intruders which the dendritic cell has presented on its membrane. When it finally finds one, a chain reaction takes place. The helper T cell is activated. It quickly duplicates thousands of times. Some become memory T cells that stay in the lymph node and will make you practically immune against this enemy. Some travel to the field of battle to help out. And the third group goes on to travel to the center of the lymph node to activate a very powerful weapons factory. Like the T cells, they're born with a specific setup. And when a B cell and a T cell with the same setup meet, hell breaks loose. The B cell duplicates rapidly and starts producing millions of little weapons. 
they work so hard that they would literally die from exhaustion very fast. Here, helper T cells play another important role. They stimulate the hard-working factories and tell them, don't die yet, we still need you, keep going. This also ensures that the factories die if the infection is over so the body doesn't waste energy or hurt itself. But what is produced by the B cells? You've heard of them, of course, antibodies. Little proteins that are engineered to bind to the surface of the specific intruder. There are even different kinds of antibodies that have slightly different jobs. The helper T cells tell the plasma cells which type is needed the most in this particular invasion. Millions of them flood the blood and saturate the body. Meanwhile, at the site of infection, the situation is getting dire. The in so now this doesn't really relate because it's not an infection, right? The vaccine essentially has done its job. If you can, if the your body can get some of those dendritic cells to express the spike protein and then display the chunks, the like broken down pieces and fragments of the spike protein on its surface, move to the lymph node and get all of that previous T cell and B cell stuff to occur, then you have uh, been able to produce some antibodies against the spike protein alone. People that have actually been infected with the COVID virus itself, their bodies have done this whole pr entire process, but they have actually had the infection occurring. So their, uh, you know, the all the rest of the story would play on, but in their lung or in their um, uh, nasal passages or wherever the infection seems to be at the most. But I just thought that was pretty fun and interesting. And then that kind of levied me into the uh, Pymel assignment, which is going to be investigating the structure of the spike protein. Um, so I guess to, to like short answer how the vaccine works, right? It's essentially a, a, a lipid vesicle then the inside that has the mRNA strand that codes for the COVID spike protein. When it's injected into your arm, you immediately start to have an immune response. Your body's attacking the, the, the lipid package because it's foreign, but eventually a dendritic cell will get some of them and they will express the code of the mRNA, so making that spike protein. They'll break it apart into chunks and then display those chunks on the surface. And then they will make their way up to the lymph node. So it's the whatever lymph nodes closest to the arm you get your shot on is the one that's gonna be doing most of the work where the T cell meets up and uh, then it goes off and uh, it activates a B cell and the B cell makes those antibodies. Then you hopefully have memory T cells so that if you actually got infected with the COVID vaccine, you've already got your immune system that has a, you know, a route to produce antibodies to block the actual COVID uh, viral particle with the spike proteins on it from entering into your cells. Okay, so on a scale of maybe zero is, I have no idea what you just said, and five's like, oh, that's awesome, I get it. How do you feel about explaining how the COVID vaccine would work to a family member? And you can do this in the chat box. I would just like to know, you know, where you stand. Um, and maybe uh, in a second number, uh, how do you feel? Do you feel like uh, you learned something about how it works? Like, did you start off knowing? Did you not have any idea how it worked? Or do you feel like maybe now you have a better understanding of how the vaccine, the mRNA vaccine might work? Because honestly, in our futures, I think when things like this occur, I think this uh, mRNA vaccine is going to be a very likely um, route to quickly try to uh, immunize people from dangerous diseases. Um, so like I said, hopefully you feel like you came in today not knowing much, and now you kind of have an idea. Again, if you rewatch that video and think of it in terms of the bacteria being the the, the lipid ball with the mRNA strand on the inside uh, and the rest of the process still is pretty similar. All right, what's the time we have here? Get this out of the way. 3.07, okay. So how about with the, um, the last uh, five minutes, if you need to leave, that's fine. But what I would like to do is just kind of look over that uh, 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 quiz that I made for with you guys real quick. Um, no, I don't need to go that far back. Come up here, you go home, and you scroll down a little bit to, and again, it's, you don't have to complete this, it's, but it is, it will count towards a bonus on your exam one score, okay? So this is not required of you to complete, um, but if you do, you're working for bonus points on this exam, okay? 
Um, also, I mentioned it's an individual assignment. I encourage you to hang out and chat with each other and ask, hey, what do you think about this structure? Do you think it looks good? Is it publication quality? Um, but you can't like make images and send images to one another to use in your figure. So you need to create your own PyMall images and you need to be the one generating your maybe final figures and labels and stuff in PowerPoint. Okay. I've got a little video here that, you know, is a little tiny inspiration. It's about a minute. Um, and essentially there are three PDB codes you'll have to work with. So we have the structure of the spike protein in its closed conformation. We have the structure of the spike protein bound to the human uh, cell receptor, so the ACE receptor. And, and then we have the um, antigen antibody interaction between the, uh, the spike protein and a human antibody fragment. So if you think about the letter, the Y-shaped, uh, the Y-shaped uh, uh, sh the shape of antibodies, the ends are where the antigens are. The ends of the Y at the top are where the antigens would be. And the antigens are what identifies the, the, uh, the um, like the, the, sorry, like the invader, right? It's where the, there's variation in your antibodies and that's what's gonna bind to the target, okay? Uh, so we've got essentially the fragment of this antibody. You don't have, again, the whole antibody. It's not a real thing but it's just that like the one Y leg with the antigen site on it. Okay, so if we look at kind of the quiz, we've got four things real quick and I'll, I'll I open them all up so there shouldn't have to be any PyMol duplicating uh, structures or anything going on. Um, but so like the very first question is generate a publication quality image that highlights the quaternary structure of COVID-19 spike protein in the closed conformation. So let me pull up PyMol super quick and maybe just kind of look at and do this first one for you and try to get you to kind of look around the spike protein structure. Um, fetch, what's my code? Uh, 6M39. And let me share this. Okay, so fetch 6M39. And here's what I get. So it's it's massive. So the spike protein itself is a total of about four, 1,400 amino acids. Um, this structure only is about the first 1,000. It does not include the part that uh, sticks into the lipid membrane because honestly, trying to get anything in the lipid membrane to crystallize is really, really difficult. So essentially, this is the part that really sticks out outside of the viral particle. I'll just go ahead and do action preset pretty. Okay, so here's what it looks like. And again, it's, I mean, it's a pretty big structure. Uh, it's got a lot of extra, so just on the end, ends I can see already. These are just little molecules that are probably uh, fragments left over from the crystallization. So it was probably in the liquid that was used to crystallize. So we're just, I'm just gonna hide the sticks because it's not part of the protein. That's just part of the crystallization a liquid, okay? I'll display the sequence mode in chains or in chain identifiers. And immediately you should see that there's only three chains and they're the same three chains. So the overall quaternary structure of the uh, spike protein, it's tetrameric, it's a homo tetramer. So for each of these, you could color you know, them by element and see by element, color, by element. So it's, uh, there is the spike protein homo tetramer, okay? This kind of inside, see these alpha helices kind of in towards the center, like pole uh, of this uh, protein, those never really leave, but do you see all these beta sheets at the top? Some of those, this one especially, the one that's I believe is like pointed most towards the tippy top of the structure, kind of a, oops, sorry, like right here, these things that I'm trying to select, that is the receptor binding domain. So out of this entire spike protein, only kind of like one of these beta sheets uh, binds to the human uh, cell receptor, okay? And so one the next question, it kind of asks you to look into that and some of the structures 
are are really, you know, you, I want you to just kind of like investigate and have fun, but think of it in the bigger context of like, you're looking at the structure of the spike protein that has pretty much wreaked havoc on your life for the last year and a half. <laughs> um, so maybe you take out your anger on it. I don't know, but you know, that's kind of what the assignment has you going for. All right. So uh, I'll let you, I mean, that wasn't publication quality. I need to change the color space. I need to make the background white. Um, there's some other things for sure, right? I would need to do to make that look better. Um, but you know, that's what, that would be your first image. So there are four total images I would like for you to make. A couple of them have, you know, multiple pieces inside the image. So I call them panels. Um, but, you know, have fun with that bonus assignment and, you know, think about it in terms of chapter four as you're working on it. So that's all I have for you all today. I'm happy to stay on and answer any other questions that you might have about anything, either the test or anything I said today. Um, so I'll just kind of hang on. Uh, and if not, good luck this weekend studying for the exam. Uh, again, at the beginning, I kind of listed off some of the big things and I will try to my best by tomorrow evening post kind of some like learning outcomes for the different chapters, but it's essentially going to be kind of what I was talking in the beginning. All right, that's all I'll say. So again, have a great day, uh, but I will hang on and be happy to answer any questions that you might have. You can chat them or you could unmute yourself. It either works for me. Um, Dr. Hughes. Yeah. Can I go over the binding curves again? Yes. Uh, I'm assuming you're talking about like the hemoglobin binding curve and myoglobin binding curve. Um, zoom, zoom, share screen. Why don't I know how to do this all of a sudden? Zoom, okay, let me just pull up the slides on my computer. Uh, are you, yeah, um, yeah, sure, we'll just start here and we'll go from there. Share this, share. Okay, so in general, the big things to know about hemoglobin and myoglobin binding curves is that they, ha they have different shapes and the shapes mean something. So the myoglobin curve has a hyperbolic shape. Oh, sorry, let me get my, uh, annotate this, this. So the myoglobin curve has a hyperbolic shape and the hemoglobin her curve has a sigmoidal shape. So the sigmoidal shape is more S-like and this hyperbolic curve doesn't really have that S character at all uh, to it. Sigmoidal binding curves indicate that there is some level of cooperativity with that protein. Uh, cooperativity can only happen if you have, uh, if you're have more, if you're more than a monomer. So myoglobin can't do anything cooperative, uh, cooperatively because it's a monomer. Hemoglobin being a tetramer though, it can, it could show that it binds things cooperative and it does because the binding curve is sigmoidal, okay? Um, reading these curves, right, the y-axis is going to have the, it's either going to be percent bound or fraction bound, and the x-axis is going to be the uh, uh, partial pressure of oxygen, okay, and the partial pressure of oxygen can vary depending upon where you are elevation wise. Um, typically at sea level, the partial pressure of oxygen is roughly 100 torr, and the partial pressure of oxygen that's uh, uh, that in your tissues, remember I said there's low concentration of oxygen, uh, it's about 30 tor. Could be 40 tor. If you were running and working out really hard, you're gonna be using up oxygen a lot faster. So you might be on the lower end of this range. Maybe it's like 20, 25 tor if you're, again, like running or playing a sport because uh, you're using that oxygen. As long as you're under uh, aerobic respiration, I guess I should say. Um, so you can also find what's called the P50 value, and that's just is the pressure of oxygen at 50% uh, bound. Uh, this doesn't really tell you much, like a P50 doesn't tell you if something has a <clears throat> like a sigmoidal shape or not. 
but it does tell you a little bit about how well that um, protein binds oxygen. So uh, the lower the P50 value, right? It means that that protein binds it better because in order just to even get to 50% of the protein having it bound, you know, you only need this very small amount of oxygen. So that's kind of the only thing that these P50 values would tell you. Uh, as far as shifting in the curve goes, because I'm also assuming that likely reading the curves isn't too bad, but maybe it's the shifting that can get a little, uh, you have to think about a lot. Uh, and even I definitely have to all, like slow down and logically think through why that, would, that shift would cause that. Um, a right shift of the curve, of that sigmoidal binding curve, stabilizes the T state. So, or the deoxy form of hemoglobin. So it makes, you know, that's kicking off those oxygens. A left shift of the curve stabilizes the R state. It makes it bind oxygen better and tighter, right? Actually, if you shift that curve to the right, and if you shift it far enough, sorry, let me scroll up here real quick. If I were to take this blue curve and shift it super far to the right, it might, it's gonna start looking really close to this myoglobin curve. And remember I said myoglobin binds uh, oxygen really well. I mean, it has that really low P50 value. So maybe if that's a way that you remember the difference between the left shift and the right shift is that if you think about these two on the same one graph, and if you were to move the hemoglobin curve to the left, that that means it stabilizes the R state because it's getting more like myoglobin, which binds oxygen really tight, really well. And then again, the right shift uh, essentially kicks, uh, stabilizes the T state and kicks off the oxygens easier. So then your goal would be to go through and rationalize why some of these things that I've mentioned here would create that shift. Um, man, I forget the reason why if you got colder, that would hug the that would create a binding that goes to the left. And the only thing I can think of is that if you get colder, you're slowing down the kinetic movements of your molecules more. And so the ability for the uh, hemoglobin to switch between states or have you know, molecules coming on and off would, get, would be less because you're slowing down the kinetics of the whole system. So that would shift it towards like the, hemo the oxygen just staying on the hemoglobin. But again, that, I mean, there's probably a different biological reason for that. Like in um, uh, uh, like frostbite, like what happens when your fingers get frostbite and you know turn purple and fall off eventually if that were to happen? It'd be super unfortunate, but maybe it's also like the other thing that just I think of if I think of that is that why waste oxygen on the the extremities right like when you need to keep your uh heart pumping your lungs expanding and contracting through the diaphragm so you know your extremities are you know we don't want them to be uh easily removed or whatever the word is where they can uh you don't really need them uh the more important stuff is the core of your body uh, uh i'm blanking on that word but anyways, that's what I'm thinking. So, you know, it holds on to the oxygen more because then it'll like move back towards your body and deliver oxygen. I don't know, I'm spending too much time on decreased temp. Decreased 2,3-B, oh, sorry? Was, was the word visceral? Like, no, that would be a good one. I mean, uh, it's, it's more of like, um, <laughs> I'm thinking of like, if you're in a gang and you got that one guy that you don't need anymore there, you know, he's expendable, right? Expendable. That's the word I think I was looking for. He's expendable. <laughs> so do uh, decrease two, three BPG, um, that, binds oxygen tighter because uh because it 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 helps just yeah the if you have it bound it stabilizes the t state or the release of oxygen like it just confirmationally the quaternary structure it will want to kick off those oxygens so uh you would flip it for the other way decreasing the h plus does the opposite of the bohr effect uh and so we just talked about the bohr effect where when you add you increase your uh, h plus concentration that ends up protonating those histidines, which strengthens an interaction between 2,3-BPG and a hemoglobin molecule, which then would end up kicking off those oxygens. So decreasing the H plus would reverse that. So those histidines would, would be more neutral. So 2,3-BPG doesn't bind as well. Like 
you don't have that really nice ion pair to hold it in place. Um, and so that was why it has more of that R function. Fetal hemoglobin, because fetuses don't have lungs that are exposed to air. So they are, I mean, also fetuses are parasites. I mean, de definition wise, that's, that's a thing. <laughs> they take everything from the host, all nutrients and everything. So in order to get oxygen so that their cells can also grow, develop, I mean, the development of a fetus from one cell to a tiny infant baby in nine months requires a massive amount of energy on that uh, fetus's part. So lots of oxygen is going to be needed in order to at least have the ATP available uh, quickly uh, through aerobic respiration uh, processes. Um, so that has a, it's a point mutation and it's a point mutation in that cavity that binds the 2,3 uh, BPG where the a histidine is uh, mutated to a threonine. So look, now instead of maybe having a positive charge there, now you're just totally getting rid of that positive charge. So the uh, any 2,3 BPG doesn't bind like at all to that. Um, I mean, some still always gonna bind, but you, you decrease the amount that's gonna bind because it's just not a favorable, you know, charge-charge uh, complement on that, in that cavity anymore for it to bind. Um, and then the last one here is carbon monoxide. So carbon monoxide is kind of a, it right shifts, but it doesn't right shift because it binds oxygen tighter. It right, or sorry, it left shifts uh, because the carbon monoxide doesn't ever leave. <laughs> So it appears as though it has something bound to it. Um, carbon monoxide is this linear guy and it, and it just, uh, so the oxygen when it binds is a little tilted, but when carbon monoxide binds, it's straight up and down, practically perpendicular to the iron center. It's just really hard to get rid of that once it's in there. Uh, the binding, it binds tighter. It has a better binding affinity than oxygen does. And so it has the appearance as though it looks like hemoglobin's binding oxygen better, but in reality, it's binding the carbon monoxide best, like better. Okay, so then that's for all the left shifts, which stabilize the R state or holding on to the oxygen, kicking off the oxygens or stabilizing the T state, um, increased temperature. So again, opposite temperature, that'd be just a quick Google search to figure out what, what that one's doing. Um, increased 2,3 BPG, yep, it binds in that cavity, which then allows for the oxygens to kick off and then increased H plus. And that goes back to the Bohr effect where an increase in H plus can protonate the histidines allowing 2,3 BPG to bind better and hence kicking off the oxygens and moving you to the right. Okay, so hopefully that was a good, <laughs> um, are you okay with that explanation, Preston, of the binding curve? Does that help? Or do you have any more questions specifically about the binding curve? Uh, not specifically about the binding curve, but I guess what exactly kicks off um, the oxygen? And like yeah. Uh-huh. So, so that can be a couple things. So the first thing is remember, I mean, a couple things that pop into my head and a couple slides that help try to uh, show you. So the first thing is, so here's like the myoglobin picture and it has this pocket where the prosthetic group's bound and this oxygen molecule is gonna have to sneak in like through, uh, you know, above the prosthetic group and through uh, the protein to sit and bind in that kind of pocket area, right? Um, so conformational changes on the surface, remember this GIF, right here, remember this gift here. So the differences between the T and the R state have to deal with um, shifting tertiary structures and that can open up that cavity a little bit better to allow the oxygen to enter or leave uh, better. The other thing I'm thinking is that if once one oxygen leaves, so, oh, sorry, once one oxygen leaves, it's easier for others to leave because of the cooperative, the cooperative nature of hemoglobin. And so that again has to deal with removing and shifting that iron out of the plane of the porphyrin ring, allowing the, sorry, I'm trying to move this and I'm scrolling instead. 
um, allowing the oxygen, again, more space to get in and get out of that protein cavity. So maybe think that this iron has that big electron cloud because I think iron has like 29 electrons. So it, when you shift towards the deoxy state, you bring that iron center down a little bit and that's gonna create even more space to allow this oxygen to, to leave. And the 2,3 the BPG binding might stabilize this alpha helix to pull, right? Like to pull the irons kind of down to give the oxygen that space to leave as well. That's my guess, like that's my hypothesis. You're asking great questions that are beyond what will be on my exam. <laughs> Good MCAT type questions for sure. <laughs> uh, but so the oxygen is released like when it goes from that R to the T state, correct? Is that? Yes, yeah, because the T state that the favors the deoxygenated, so that favors kicking off and the R state favors having things bound. I mean, the other piece to that puzzle is the, um, uh, uh, the fact that it's, this is not an all or nothing thing. Like it's not always like four are bound or four are kicked off. All right, if we look back at the binding curve and you go back between lung and tissue, it looks like on average one to two oxygen molecules are removed. It doesn't go from fully oxygenated four molecules bound to zero molecules bound. So um, you just essentially have to kick off one of the oxygens from the four subunits. Uh, oh. and again, that kind of makes things a little more complicated. I'm gonna stop recording because this is, again, I love that I love a conversation. This is just beyond what I want everybody to worry about for the test or for my class. <laughs>